Safer Roads Humber, proud sponsors of On Your Bike, taking cycle safety seriously. Welcome back. Yes, it's Luke Adams here and I am indeed back with a new series of On Your Bank. You may well remember our first great series of the programme when I cycled the length and breadth of our wonderful region, uncovering some of the area's hidden gems and meeting people who had a passion for cycling and their local area. And we're back, riding in on the crest of a cycling wave. It seems everyone is doing it. Cycling is certainly becoming more and more popular, whether it's for fitness or leisure. In this series of episodes, I'm taking to the pedal again to look at some of the routes taken by some professional cyclists for two major races. To start, the route taken by competitors on the North Lincolnshire and Scunthorpe leg on the Tour of Britain. I'll be meeting some cyclists along the way and visiting some of the area's most popular visitor sports. North Lincolnshire is home to a variety of cycling routes. These include the Ancombe Valley Way and the Ridgeway. For the first time ever, North Lincolnshire hosted an entire stage of the OVO Energy Tour of Britain. 120 of the world's top cyclists undertook a 172km stage in September. They started at Normanby Hall Country Park and finished in Central Park in Scunthorpe. Relaunched in 2004 after a five-year hiatus, the event is British Cycling's premier road cycling event, where cycling fans can see the world's best teams and riders competing right on their doorsteps. North Lincolnshire hosted Stage 3 of the eight-staged event. I'm certainly not a pro like the Tour of Britain cyclists, perhaps an amateur, keen to discover what the area has to offer. But to undertake all this cycling, I need a bike and a brush up on my cycling safety knowledge. So I've come to Rusty Cycles in Scunthorpe, a well-known family-run business of 75 years. I'm sure the cycles aren't rusty, as the name of the store would suggest. No, it's a nickname, which goes back to the founder, the ginger-haired boy who played out with wet hair. After many years of repairing cycles in his parents' kitchen, Rusty set up his business in 1939. He worked right up to his death in 1982. Today, the shop is run by his daughter Sandra, along with her trusty staff. Chris, good morning. Rusty Cycles, great name for a shop. Yes. What's its history? Uh, Rusty Cycles got its name from the person who started the business initially back in 1939 because he was ginger haired, hence his nickname was Rusty. Um, and then we moved to these premises in 1959 um, and unfortunately we lost Mr Rusty in 1982. Uh, where Sandra, the current owner, um, took on the business. That's his daughter. Okay, so she's the daughter yeah. of, of good old Rusty. Of good old Rusty, yes. How long have you been here? I've been here just over four years now. Um, good place to be. As, a, as an avid cyclist, it's candy store. <laughs> Chris, there's been a definite surge in cycling Definitely. over the last couple of years. Why do you think that is? Um, a lot of people have been bitten by the bug from road cycling. And yeah, it has been a massive upsurge. Um, I think with the inflation um, and things like that, people are starting to use bikes for getting to and from work more as well. Cycle schemes and things like that have been a big bonus for us. Um, but yeah, people are becoming more conscious of their health as well, so that obviously plays a big part in it. Well, you've given me the inspiration to get on my bike again. Good, fantastic. Chris. And I can see behind you on the counter, yep. you've lined up some cycling Certainly safety have. equipment for me. Certainly so can have. we step over to the counter? Yes, and of course have we a can. what we have there? Yep. And this is the bright colour, first of all. Yes, the uh, high vis to make you a lot more visible to other road okay. users on there. Um, you are obviously quite vulnerable, so you need to protect yourself. It's right. your responsibility. So we'll start off with the helmet. Thank you very much. High vis, there you go. Thank you. The next thing we would advocate, high vis jacket. Okay. This is obviously the polite one, so it makes people 
no tissue and um, just gives you that extra visibility on there. So okay. if you'd like okay. to very much, Chris. slip that on. And then finally, your high-vis gloves. Um, if you are unfortunate enough to come off your bike, the first thing you do, natural instinct, is to put your hands down to try to break your fall. So gloves, massive protection just for skin abrasions. The high-vis, so that when you are indicating, again, other road users can see which way you're going, your intention on the road. Chris, thank you very much indeed. You're very welcome, no problems. Well, that's the bike sorted, and what a great bike it is. But first, a brush up on my cycling safety knowledge. Richard Hall is a road safety expert with over 30 years experience. He's road safety team manager for North Lincolnshire Council, the perfect person to give me some hints and tips. Richard, good morning. Thank good you morning. very much for coming along to Rusty Cycles in Scunthorpe. Why is road safety so important for cyclists? Well, cyclists are quite vulnerable on the road. There's not a lot protecting them. And therefore, they, they need to be careful out on the road. They need to follow the, uh, the, the rules of the road, which is important. But also, they need to help protect themselves. First of all, if you're planning a route, make sure you know where you're going. You plan that route carefully so you know the roads and you know the, the, uh, the sorts of roads that you'll be going on. Also, be realistic about the, uh, the, the route you're going on. And I think it, it, that goes for any route, whether it's in the towns or out on the Tour of Britain route, is plan your route, check it, uh, make sure you're familiar with it so you know where you're going and you know the type of roads you're going to be on. Uh, but the key thing is, whenever you're out on your bike, is uh, thinking about your safety, making sure that, you, uh, that uh, you're looking ahead, you're seeing what's going on around you, um, you're uh, looking behind you when you're, you're turning, and you're in the right position in the road. And we're finally off, taking a section of the route travelled by the professionals in the Tour of Britain. We start and finish at Normanby Hall. It's a classic English mansion, just five miles north of Scunthorpe. I'll be visiting the hall later and meeting some of the people who keep the estate in fine form. But first, let's bike. You won't strain your eyes to see me. I've arrived at a spot called Julian's Bower. The name was given to turf mazes across England. Only one of these still exists today, right in the heart of North Lincolnshire at Altborough. The maze overlooks Altborough Flats and the rivers Trent, Ouse and Humber. It's 43 feet across, but its origins remain a mystery. Some sources suggest it was cut by monks in the 12th century. Others suggest it was used by the medieval church as a way of expressing penance. The maze has scheduled ancient monument status, a title given to a nationally important archaeological site in the United Kingdom, which is given protection against unauthorised change. John, good afternoon. Thank you very much good indeed afternoon. for your time. First of all, it's not actually a maze, I believe, Julian's No, to give it its correct title, it's a labyrinth. I mean, it always gets referred to as a maze. Everybody uh, does, and I'm guilty of that myself. But uh, to give it its proper title, it is a labyrinth, yeah. Is it a popular attraction? Do people it is. Come? It is, yeah. Quite a lot of um, uh, kids, you know, school parties and, and things like that come and, um, and have a... Um, probably have a drink, bring a bit of a picnic and have it here and um, uh, walk around. Obviously the kids love to walk or run around the maze. Um, and I mean, that's that's probably why that it, it, it squash, if, it, if, it, if it's wet weather, the paths do squash and squash out and that's why it wants uh, maintaining. But that's what it's there for, for the kids running around and I like nothing better than to see um, people enjoying it. Why do you think people should come and visit this little spot, John? Well, where else can you find something like this? Um, you know, it's lovely. I mean, as you see, you can see the view and the maze and, you know, uh, so the maze, the backdrop and everything. And, um, you know, where else could you go to see a maze and, and a backdrop like that? John, Absolutely. thank you very much indeed for your time. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm back at Normanby Hall. It was built between 1825 and 1830 for Sir Robert Sheffield. Now the Sheffield family moved out of the hall in 1963. It is still owned by them, but now managed by North Lincolnshire Council.
The former estate around the hall, stretching some 350 acres, is now a country park. It includes a farming museum, duck ponds, a deer sanctuary and even a miniature railway, all run by an army of dedicated staff. Paul, good afternoon. Thank you very much for meeting me here in the beautiful walled garden of Normanby Hall Country Park. Mm, no problem. Why should people come and visit Normanby Hall Country Park if they're cycling in the local area? Um, well, there's a, there is a lot to see. It's a, quite a nice stopping off point. Obviously, we've got the walled garden here if you're interested in horticulture. But we've got, um, obviously, the deer park. There's a lot for children now. That's beginning to increase year on year. So splash pad, play area. We now have a land train as well, which is taking visitors up through the extent of the park and back. Um, we've also got uh, a fairly new multi-user uh, multi footpath through the woods, which means we've got full disabled access for people that wouldn't be able to access those areas previously. Well, we've got the War Gallery now, which we put in in 2014, um, and it really commemorates how the house was used in the First and Second World War, and that really is a fascinating piece of the, the history. Um, there's the activity room that all the children enjoy, um, and it gets them to dress up, and they could do quizzes, and the families can join in, and that's a really nice room. Uh, and then just so we've got some marvellous paintings and furniture, really, that there's something for everybody to look round. Join me in part two, where I'll be visiting one of the country's smallest listed buildings, visiting a former college used by priests, and paying a trip to an historic market town. Safer Roads Humber, proud sponsors of On Your Bike, taking cycle safety seriously. Safer Roads Humber, proud sponsors of On Your Bike, taking cycle safety seriously. I've arrived at Curtin in Lindsay, which has an interesting past. Catherine Parr, the sixth wife of Henry VIII, lived here. She married Sir Edward Burra, who was the eldest son and heir to Sir Thomas Burra, the first Baron Burra. The Baron Burras of Gainsborough were an old and well-established gentry family. Catherine's duty was to bear sons, which never happened. Her husband died in 1533. Following her husband's passing, it's thought Catherine spent time with the Dowager Lady Strickland in Cumbria. She married Henry VIII in 1547 and died aged 35 the following year. Curtin Lindsay is also home to one of England's smallest listed buildings, a whipping post which dates back to the 18th century. Situated outside the old police station on Spar Hill, it's the town's most prominent landmark. In fact, it even has Grade 2 listed building status as part of English Heritage's scheduled monuments record. Today, the thought of whipping someone for a misdemeanor may seem totally barbaric, but throughout the early part of the 18th century, public punishments took place for a whole range of misnomers, from stealing cheese to a great coat. It's likely that the post was moved when the police house was built around 1890 from the ruins of the prison. It remains in this position today, but the old police house is now a private residence. The sentence of whipping was finally abolished by Section 2 of the Criminal Justice Act of 1948. Here in Curtin are a team of avid cyclists, the Curtin Lindsay Cycling Club. The group has around 25 members and meets three times a week for rides. They're all set to take on a 30-mile section of route used in the Tour of Britain. The rides generally uh, from probably 40 to 60 mile in, in, in length mileage. Um, and uh, we generally stop off for coffee and cake somewhere along the way. So just, just to rest the old feet. That's right, yeah. And to, uh, to have, a, again, a bit of a social chat and, and, a, and a, a talk of what's, what's going on. You're going to do um, one of the routes of the Tour of Britain. Why that particular route you're going to go on? Uh, well, a, it's, it's, it's the route what is from Scunthorpe, um, well from Normby Hall, uh, just outside Scunthorpe and it uh, tracks round by uh, 
uh, Kidby and Crowell, and then it actually comes through Curtin Lindsay. So uh, we're going to ride the route from Curtin Lindsay today up to Barton on Humber. Uh, we're not going fully along the route because part of the route on the day follows quite a busy road from Brig out towards uh, Kermington and that's an A road and we try to keep off A roads or busy roads and stay on minor roads and B roads so we're going to slightly deviate that route today just to uh, keep off the main roads. I'll be catching up with the riders later but I'm doing a little detour of my own now to sample the small market town of Brig. During the Anglo-Saxon period, the area became known as Glanford. It's been used as a crossing point to the Ancombe and as an access point to the river for thousands of years to buy and sell goods and services. It was once the property of the Tyrit family. Winkley markets are held in the town on a Thursday and Saturday. Many notable residents have lived here, including Malcolm Fleming. He was a Scottish physiologist who practised medicine in the town in the 1750s. Thomas Ball was a Member of Parliament of New Zealand and he was born in Brick in 1809. He trained as a pharmacist in the town until 1859, where he eventually led a team of over 100 people and emigrated to New Zealand. A modern resident of the town is Rob Waltham. Born and bred in Brick, Rob is the leader of North Lincolnshire Council. He took over in January 2017 and was awarded an MBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours List five months later for his services to local government. These total 20 years. I'm meeting him at the Angel, one of Brig's oldest and most attractive buildings. It dates back to the 17th century when it was used as a coaching inn. You're born and bred in the town. What's so great about Brig? Well, lots of things. I mean, I think if you come to Brig on a Thursday and a Saturday, the first thing you'll see is that we've got a really vibrant market. We've got lots of independent shops. We've got a really um, busy market town here. But also at the same time, I would say because of the policies of the local council, bringing free car parking into the area, we've got uh, regeneration investment around the river. We've got really low um, vacancy rates around our shops. So there's lots about Brig, lots of walkways, lots of open countryside and it's just a really special place. I live here, I love it and why wouldn't I? So a good place you would recommend for cyclists to come and pay a visit as they're on their travels? Absolutely, I mean Brig is, um, well not least because I've just signed up to do the North Lincolnshire Sportif which is 101 miles, every one will be painstaking I'm sure but um, yeah it's great because you're out into the open countryside but also we've got great cycle trails you know throughout uh, Brig itself so you can cycle up to Rawby and up the hill if you're brave enough uh, and up and around and access into Barnetby and, and, and then on your way towards Grimsby in Cleethorpes uh, as part of a journey. You've got routes, as I've said, about the River Ancombe Way and taking you up and uh, the Ancombe, of course, going straight down um, into Lincolnshire itself. So there's great routes all around uh, there itself. But we've got lots of B roads, which are great, um, a great setting to be able to get away, be safe, because you've not got the uh, traffic, which is what I particularly like about it as I'm learning to uh, ride my new bike. Uh, but also at the same time, you know, you've got great scenery. The Angel is home to the Brick Heritage Centre, a labyrinth of rooms and discoveries. One of the star exhibits is the Bronze Age Brick Raft. Over 3,000 years old, it was found in the nearby River Ancombe in the 1970s. It's a flat-bottomed oak boat that was stored away for nearly 40 years before being put on display at the centre in 2013. I've enjoyed my history lesson on Brick, but it's time to set off on my bike again now and to one of the area's other historic features. This is Thornton Abbey, located close to Thornton Curtis. It was once one of the richest Augustine abbeys by the late 13th century. The first Earl of Albemarle founded the abbey in 1139 and is buried here. The abbey successfully survived the dissolution of monasteries, a set of administrative and legal processes where Henry VIII disbanded monasteries in England and Wales. As it was used as a secular college for priests, it was eventually closed in 1547. A house was later constructed in the 17th century. Little is known about what happened to it. Records suggest it was either dismantled or never even completed. Kevin, how important is the Abbey to history? It's 
it's important for academics. It's important for what it is, this great Augustinian house uh, in, in Britain. It's important architecturally. But in a way, it's important for this area, for North Lincolnshire. It demonstrates just how wealthy, how powerful, how influential a place like Thornton Abbey in North Lincolnshire was in, in the medieval times. If Thornton had survived, if Thornton had carried on as a college, you can imagine here a great urban centre, quite a rich commercial centre based around this phenomenal structure. And North Lincolnshire, certainly this area, is part of it, very different to the tranquil, peaceful and rather beautiful countryside that we have now. Absolutely. Following its use as a college then, Kevin, did anybody actually live in the Abbey? Not, well, they lived within the grounds and they, 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 they dismantled the church, essentially, and its other buildings to build their own grand houses. Um, a, a succession of people were granted it by the king, including this chap, Sir Vincent Skinner, who seems to have been quite a, uh, quite a lad of the 16th and 17th century, a bit of a lobbyist, a member of parliament, someone who attached himself to the great wealthy of the day, uh, obviously said the right things and gained the wealth and the status to go with it. Now, he dismantled, as far as we can see, quite a lot of the buildings here, okay. built his own grand house to show off who he was in society. Now, a, a rather uh, sarcastic commentator 100 years later recalls that Vincent's house, grand house, falls down before he'd even had a chance to move into it because it was so badly built. Uh, so Vincent dies in a debtor's prison, and I think, uh, I think the commentator was rather suggesting that if you build your life on vague foundations, then ultimately that's what happens to you. It's about time I caught up with the Curtin Lindsay Cycling Club. They're certainly way ahead of me on my bike at the Far Ings Nature Reserve in Barton-upon-Humber. Ings is an old English word for the wet pastures to the west of Barton. They were once part of the Humber floodplain. The reserve was badly flooded in December 2013 by a storm surge when water overtopped the Humber Bank. The centre was closed for nearly a year while repair work was carried out. It's in the hands of the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust who've developed the natural habitats of floodplains successfully over the years. We've, we've got all sorts of things that live here. Um, we have a great team of volunteers who are available to chat to people um, that man the visitor centre. There's myself and my colleague. Like I say, we run the education programme, so whether we do informal kids' activities during the holidays or we work closely with schools to do different curriculum-based stuff or whether you're a university student who wants to come and do some research or even um, evening classes and courses. Plus, we have... Um, clubs and societies that use the centre in an evening, um, whether it's stargazing you're into, evening talks about wildlife. So there's, there's something for everybody. If you want to learn a bit more about the natural world and what's out and about, then this is the place to come. If you've been inspired to get on your bike, but want some tips and advice on riding in the countryside, follow the links to our website, estuary.tv. Join me next time when I'll be all electric, enjoy a spot of animal magic, and I'll be all at sea. Safer Roads Humber, proud sponsors of On Your Bike, taking cycle safety seriously.